All right, this is part 15 in our Synchronizing the Gospel series, and this will be the concluding presentation in our study of the gospel message, the life of Messiah, his ministry as foretold in Daniel chapter 9, verse about 24 through 26. This particular uh, presentation is called Baptism by Fire. And so we'll have prayer. Gracious Father, please bless us as we steady. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and help us to discern and understand the truth and to have the right and true gospel. We praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, so the prophecy we've been looking at and seeing how it applied in the life of Christ is found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, where it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. There's been a whole lot of ground in that particular prophecy, hasn't there? And so what we have seen in this series, and I'm just going to recap briefly, is that the gospel writers were not putting the life of Christ in chronological order. Rather, the gospel writers were showing Yeshua's fulfillment of the Samach roles. Samach is Hebrew for the word we have in our Bible as branch. So these were the branch prophecies, the fivefold ministry roles of Messiah. Thank you so much. And they show his validity. We have Matthew showing that he was the king, Mark that he was the servant, uh, Luke that he was the son of man, John in the Gospel of John that he was the son of Yah, and John in the book of Revelation showing that he was the almighty judge. These are the five Samach roles or five branch prophecy roles. In this series, we've also dealt with some controversial issues like how long was Yeshua's ministry? And since Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy foretells and, and indeed was fulfilled in his life, we did see that his ministry was 490 days, not three and a half years. There are five evidences for that which we have covered in this series. Certainly the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy, which gives him 490 days from baptism by water to baptism by fire, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that is what we'll be concluding with today. We have Isaiah's prophecy that Yeshua would minister for the acceptable year of Yah. And year was singular. And we have the Jubilee prophecies, of course. And 28 AD historically is recorded that that was the Jubilee year. The age of the Passover lamb is another indicator for the every element of the Passover lamb was fulfilled in Christ. He was a male. He was without spot or blemish. He was indeed our Passover. And we have ignored the fact that he would be a male lamb of the first year. And so not yet two years old. But he fulfilled that element as well, not in his age, but in the length of time in which he was the Passover lamb. Then we have the teachings of the early church. They taught that he ministered for a year, not three and a half. Additionally, um, as we have continued and, and, and put Yeshua's life into chronological order, we found with 28 AD being the Jubilee year and indeed the year of the crucifixion, that 27 AD was the beginning of his ministry and the time of his baptism. And so indeed, Yeshua went from water to fire in 490 days, and the kickoff point for his ministry was John the Baptist pronouncement, Behold the Lamb of Yah, which takes away the sin of the world. From that moment on, we were in the 490-day prophecy. Now the Pharisees during that time came up to Yeshua, and they wanted proof. They wanted proof that he was the Messiah. They said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Not that he was a rabbi, not that he was a good guy, not that he was even a teacher, no, they wanted a sign that he was Messiah, proof of Messiah's authenticity. And indeed, that is found in the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy as well, which dovetails with the Jonah prophecy. And so Yeshua said, 
in response to their request for a sign, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but, or except for, the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And we see that this is critical information. We need this information. We need to understand how Messiah has fulfilled the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy because this is the essence of the gospel. It is the proof that he is the authentic Messiah. And so this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached how far? In all the world world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And so it's a very sad thing that Christianity today has become mixed with paganism, has has brought in the tenets of the Phrygian crucifixion story, has bought into the the sun worship false Christ and his times and story, and that these things have replaced the true gospel. But it's time that we, as the followers of Yah, get back to the old paths and restore the old landmarks and truths. So indeed, instead of being Good Friday, which was Tammuz's counterfeit, the prophet Daniel foretold that the true Messiah would be slain in the midst of or middle of the week, and he was. And he died precisely at the time foretold in terms of the week and also in terms of the weeks, because it says after the 60, after, after 62 weeks, which is three score and two in the verse, In the middle of the 63rd week, he would die. And the need for all animal sacrifices would cease with his death. Hebrews 10, 1 to 10 tells us that when Yeshua died, that all animal sacrifices ceased. So it makes it very plain that Daniel 9 is in reference to Calvary. Now, additionally, by dying on Passover, which did fall in the middle of the 63rd week of his ministry... Messiah fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel 9 and Jonah, authenticating him as our one and only Messiah. And so we see here's the prophecy of Jonah and how he fulfilled it. He died in the midst of the week, which was Wednesday. And in our chart, that appears here at the beginning of the chart. And so he was how many nights in the grave? Three nights, being Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. How many days in the grave? Three days, which were Thursday, Friday, and the day of Sabbath, and before, just as the sun was going to set on Sabbath evening, when it's beginning to be evening, which is the beginning of the next day, Yeshua was raised from the dead before the sun set. So indeed, he was raised on the Sabbath. And we also see that uh, that happened on a modern calendar, April 28 would have been the 14th day of the first month in the year 28 AD. And then April 29 was the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. May 1st was the seventh day Sabbath and indeed the day of the resurrection. And so at this point now we are ready to pick up our story. Let's return to our prophecy in Daniel 9. 70 weeks. How many weeks? 70 weeks, and he died in what week? The 63rd week. In the middle of the 63rd week. So we don't have very much farther to go, do we? Today, we're going to be talking about what happened in week 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, and 70. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Now, one thing we need to understand is the 70-week prophecy is a judgment prophecy. If you look up the word determined, it's from the Hebrew word chathak, which means cut off. Now, this is one of the key prophecies that is misunderstood. It's messed up the gospel message. It's allowed the Phrygian crucifixion story and the, the story of Tammuz to replace the true Messiah. It's caused us to lose our Messiah's authenticity, and it's also caused us to not understand who is Israel and what is supposed to happen in the future in the city of Jerusalem. All of these things are foretold in this prophecy. It is perhaps the apex, the most critical, the the balance point of all prophecy. 
because this is the one that gives the Messiah's authenticity and the future authenticity as well. Very, very critical. So when the 70 weeks are up, whatever has not been saved is cut off. It's a judgment prophecy. And by the way, that is how it will be in the future as well. And you're probably wondering if this is the conclusion of the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy in synchronizing the gospel, what are we going to be studying next? Well, next I would like to go into a sister topic. I would like to study with you the 70 weeks in the final round, what this is going to look like when the Messiah comes at the end. And having just studied it in the middle round, when Yeshua was here, we are ready to look at the final round very deeply. So 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Who are thy people? This was the Jews. Yes. And upon thy holy city. What was the holy city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. We don't get this, do we? Was Jerusalem still the holy city when the 70 weeks was concluded? Oh, how important is it to know that? If we don't understand that, dear ones, we're ready for the abomination of desolation. And it wasn't very long after this prophecy was fulfilled and the 70 weeks indeed was up that the physical abomination of desolation was set up. And because the people didn't understand the fulfillment of the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy, they were all part of it instead of protected from it. And that's going to repeat in the end. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Dear ones, when you are in the 70 weeks, judgment is coming. It's intended that you be saved and it be the finishing of the transgression, making an end of sins and making reconciliation for iniquity and for you to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. Yes, this is a sealing prophecy, and I'm going to show you how it was fulfilled in the life of Messiah and his apostles. The anointing of the Most Holy, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. We saw that last time. We studied the confirming of the covenant. He hadn't come to do away with a covenant. It wasn't old covenant, new covenant. It was renewed, rebuilt covenant. And in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So we have looked at that. What did it mean when he anointed the most holy? How did that happen when Yeshua was here? Well, the earth quaked and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach who hung on the cross for us went down through the earth in that crack that went through the cross post hole and it actually fell on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, which another name for it is the Most Holy. And that's the reason that room in the sanctuary was called the Most Holy Place because the Most Holy sat in that place. And the blood anointed the most holy, literally. We have also looked at the confirming of the covenant, the teaching that we are in the new covenant now and we are new covenant Christians is really because people understand that the terms of the covenant, the old covenant, right? The old covenant, that the terms of the covenant were obedience to the Torah, and we don't want to be obedient to the Torah. We think that in this new covenant era that Yahweh is supposed to keep his promises, but we don't have any part in this marriage relationship. And so it's a common teaching that everything was nailed to the cross and I can do as I please and his blood covers. Grace, but it isn't cheap. And so we studied that concept. What was nailed to the cross? And we looked at Colossians 2, 14 through 16, and we saw that what was nailed to the cross, if you use your strong concordance, and in fact, even several modern translations actually say it right. Several of them get it wrong too. But some of them actually translate Colossians 2, 14 through 16, as the strong concordance would give you the meaning. Here's an example. The contemporary English version says, God wiped out the charges that were against us 
for disobeying the law of Moses. He took them away and nailed them to the cross. The Bible says in Daniel 9 that he had come to do away with the covenant. Does it say that he came to do away with the covenant? It says he came to confirm the covenant. We have missed almost every aspect of Daniel 9. Confirming the covenant means that the covenant was ratified with his blood. And do you know the primary meaning of confirming the covenant? Strengthening it. Because as it says in Hebrews, the blood of bulls and goats was not sufficient to pay for our sins. But when he died, his blood made it possible that the covenant would be confirmed between man who had fallen and a holy God. No, he didn't weaken the Torah. He lived it. He strengthened it by his death. And what was nailed to his cross was not the covenant. It was not the terms of the covenant. Rather, the handwritten record of our sins was nailed to his cross. And every single layer of the covenant is still in effect. Covenants are eternal. With Adam, we had the Sabbath in, mentioned in the covenant. With Noah, we had the promise given and the covenant restored in the rainbow was the evidence of it. There would not still be rainbows if there was not still a covenant with Noah and all mankind. But is God not keeping his covenant? You can know the earth will not fully be destroyed with a flood ever again. Why? Because the covenant God made with Noah is still in effect. What about the covenant with Abraham? We studied how circumcision was the token of that covenant, and yet that primarily had a spiritual meaning. It was about the circumcision of the heart, as the Bible says in Deuteronomy. From the get-go, it was primarily about spiritual circumcision. And in fact, Paul said, he is not a Jew that is one outwardly, meaning you may be circumcised in the flesh, but he is a Jew that is one inwardly, and that circumcision is the circumcision of the what? of the heart. Absolutely. All of these tokens of the covenant are still in effect because the covenants are all still in effect. And when the new covenant comes in, and it hasn't yet, we studied that and we saw, if you're just joining us today, I realize that I'm teaching things that are absolutely counter to what is taught in Christianity today. So it might be, if, you're, if it's your first time, please know this is part 15. But in the mentionings of the new covenant, it talks about how all the missionaries can be recalled because once the new covenant goes into effect, how many people on planet earth are going to know God? Everybody. Everyone from the least unto the greatest of them, they'll all know him and there'll be no one left to tell. Has that happened yet? Another thing that it says about when the new covenant goes into effect is that his law will be written in our hearts, meaning it will go against, it, it will go against the heart to sin. Does it currently go against the natural heart when we sin? No, that's right. So there is much more coming. That renewed covenant, by the way, isn't a new covenant. The old terms are all still there. It's the same meaning as new moon. It's renewed, rebuilt. And yes, the token of that covenant is spectacular. His law will be written in our hearts. And I can't wait for that day when it will be not against the grain, but with the grain to be obedient to him. And so we see that the law is not being done away with in the least particular. But that should have been clear from Daniel 9, because it said that when the Messiah came, he would do away with the covenant? No, he would confirm the covenant. And he would be confirming that covenant, especially for that one week, because in the middle of that week, he would die. And the covenant was ratified in Yeshua's own blood. And so the message for the last days is not that he did away with the covenant, but rather remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. Messiah's mission was from water to fire. We find it in Luke 12, 49 to 15. I am come to, what was his goal? Send fire, send fire on the earth. When did he send the fire on the earth? Pentecost. Shavuot, Pentecost, yes. 
And what will I if it be already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with? And how am I straightened, meaning urged, urgency, till it be accomplished? So that Pentecost in the year 28 AD would have fallen on June 20th. And Yeshua's baptism indeed was 490 days prior, and it would have been in February of that year 27 AD. All right, so how far have we gotten in tracking the life and ministry of Messiah? We had come to his resurrection, which took place on Shabbat on May 1st in a modern calendar. And May 1st was the 17th day of Abib, which is the 17th day of the first biblical month. And the first biblical month started over here on April 15th. Here's the 14th day of the first biblical month, which was Passover. The 15th day begins unleavened bread and so forth. So once you reach the day of the resurrection here, are you still in the week of unleavened bread? Yes, it lasts how long? Seven days. So pay attention as we begin our story today. Much of it is going to be starting in unleavened bread. So after Yeshua and the resurrected saints were presented at 9 a.m. on the day of first fruits in heaven, Yeshua returned and the Bible says he appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. That road to Emmaus experience happened on Sunday, May 2nd, which indeed was first fruits within the week of unleavened bread. It's uh, talked about in Luke 24, verse 13 to 16. It says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Yeshua himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Wow. Wow. I can't imagine what it must have been like to have Yeshua physically present in a conversation walking from one town to the next. But I can tell you it must have been pretty awesome. So here they were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and that road is about seven miles when you go outside the city, the old city of Jerusalem. Now let's look at the full thing. Luke 24, 17 to 21. And so Yeshua is now speaking to them, and to them he's a stranger. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Meaning like this is front page news. Everybody knows about the crucifixion of Yeshua. And hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Yeshua of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, meaning we thought he was the Messiah. But since he's dead, he still is. and besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Now, that's a very confusing phrase right there. And a lot of times people read that phrase and they say, well, then he must have died on Thursday. It couldn't have been Wednesday. There's no way it could have been Wednesday because if they on Sunday was the third day. And so... Here's where we need to remember. What was the original language of Scripture? Was it originally written in English? Sometimes there are problems in the way thoughts are communicated in our English Bibles, and we need to dig a little deeper. And this is an example of that. Because after all, Daniel 9 is pretty clear that he died in the exact middle of the week. And also we know about the Jonah prophecy with the three days and three nights. So what do we do with this? Is first fruits the third day? How can it be the third day? It looks like the fourth day to me. What do you say? 
How do we deal with this expression in Luke 24, 21? And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Well, we need to take a moment and get an answer for this. So, in other words, there are three days separating us from the event of the crucifixion, which transpired on a Wednesday. How do we know that's the meaning? Let's look. The word since is a very important word. It's from the Greek word apo, which is translated here as since, but it literally means, and you find this with your um, lexical aids, it literally means separated from the whole. Not part of, but separated from the whole. Now, if you use esword, you look it up and you see this, that and I've highlighted a few of the meanings that I think are part of that that we need to pay attention to. First of all, apo means away from something near. So it's near. I'm, I'm even touching it, but I'm not actually in it. And it also denotes separation, which is what the lexical aids say when they tell you that it means separated from the whole. So in other words, and this is something that comes out in um, the chronological gospels, there were three days separating them from the event of the crucifixion, which had transpired in the middle of the week. So it was indeed the fourth day, uh, the fourth day of, uh, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the bread that they broke together is also going to be important. But let's just take a peek here. So if you're going from Passover, right? How many days are separating them from when he died? Three. So it, to translate it that this is the third day is not, uh, is not right. It's not what it was meaning. And it's not what the Greek word there means. Let's look at one other thing that's critically important. He, as he's walking on this road to Emmaus, they ask him to come and stay with them. That they say, it's coming in late in the day. Would you please come in and eat with us. Now, what time of the year is this again? Spring. This is spring, but it's during the Feast of unleavened bread. unleavened bread. And during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts how many days? Seven. So you would start Unleavened Bread right here. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You're in Unleavened Bread until Wednesday, the 5th of May that year. So right here, as he's dining with these disciples in Emmaus, this is definitely during the week of unleavened bread. Now, what's difficult is that it appears that he eats leavened bread with them. And again, we have a translation issue. So the bread they broke together was azumon, which is the Greek for unleavened bread or matzah. But in this instance, the extant Greek texts read artos, which is the common word for normal leavened bread. And so it appears to be a simple oversight. And here I think it's helpful to look again at the chronological gospels. There are a few other writers that do mention this as well. What appears to have happened, and this is chronological gospels, page 269, and the book goes on to explain, I'm quoting, among the 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament writings, there are more than 250,000 variations. Many of these variations are the replacement of one Greek word with a very similar Greek word that was more in accord with the local language where and when the manuscript was copied. The New Testament was not transmitted in classical Greek. Why? Because who was it written for? It was written for the common people, and they didn't read classical Greek. Classical Greek has two words for bread. There is the azumon word, which means unleavened bread, and there's the artos word, which is leavened bread. Classical Greek has two words for bread. But the common Greek, which is street Greek, if you will, is uh, koinoni, or koin, or however you say it. That Greek only had the word artos. And so the term azumon referred to unleavened bread, according to the chronological gospels, it's not a word that's found in common Greek. Common Greek only had artos for bread. 
So if the Greek Bible writers had used a zumon for the bread which Yeshua broke with the disciples in Emmaus, it would have been an unfamiliar term to most Greek-speaking individuals in the Roman Empire. But indeed, we know that when he ate with them, since it was during unleavened bread, he would not have broken the Torah. So you have to understand, Bible translators have taken a little bit of license sometimes. And we don't want to make up a theology based upon one misconstrued verse. Now in John 20, verse 19, we read about his time with these disciples. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, um, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Yeshua and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. This was a very busy first fruits day. He starts off that morning going to heaven taking the resurrected saints, being waved and presented before the throne of Yah in an amazing ceremony, where, of course, as first fruits, he was fully accepted. Then the Bible says that he appeared to the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. They invited him into their home, and he was dining with them, and as he broke the bread and blessed the bread, then they recognized him, and what happened? He disappeared. And where did he go? Well, the Bible tells us that the doors were shut, and yet he appeared to his disciples coming right through the doors <laughs> in Jerusalem, and that was seven miles away. So it was a very, very busy day, and Yeshua says to them, peace be unto you. Here's a little bit more of it from John 20, verse 19 to 23. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Yeshua and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side, and then were the disciples glad when they saw the master. Can you imagine the experience of being in that room? What it would have been like to have thought all hope was lost, and then to realize, oh, I just misunderstood all the prophecies. <laughs> then said Yeshua to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And so we are beginning to see now the work of the Lamb is changing. It's changing from the remission of sins to the moving of taking this group of people out to carry the gospel to the whole world with power. Now, John 20, verse 25 tells us that the disciples told Thomas about this, and apparently he was not with them when Yeshua came into that upper room. And so they told him later, we have seen the master. And Thomas said, unless I put my hands into his wounded hands, and unless I put my hands into his side, I will not believe it. <laughs> Matthew 28, 16 tells us that after Yeshua appeared to them, the 11 disciples went into Galilee, into the mountains where Yeshua had ordained them. And then the Bible tracks the timing. It says, after eight days, according to John 20, 26, which would have been in the 65th week of Yeshua's ministry, Yeshua appeared to Thomas and the disciples. And this is the day when that would have happened. Because we can count the eight days. Now, remember, we haven't got very long. We are going to Pentecost. Pentecost concludes this journey. During this time, this period of time, Yeshua teaches several key things. And one of them is not only does he breathe on them and he tells them to receive the Holy Spirit, but he also gives them the gospel commission. We've got that wrong too. <laughs> Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So many parts of this important prophecy are twisted up. I'm not going to get into that one just yet, but I will. <laughs> we have to address the gospel commission. 
Another thing that happened during this period of time from Yeshua's return as the first fruits until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that the Bible says in John 20 that Yeshua did many wonderful things, but they didn't write them for us. And they said, the reason they didn't write them for us is because they had written enough. Their purpose was for us to know beyond all question that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God. And many other signs truly did Yeshua in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe what? That Yeshua is the Christ, the Son of Yah. That was the purpose of the gospel writers. They were showing that he was the Messiah. And the Messiah had to fulfill the five Samak branch prophecies. That was their purpose. And so John is saying, we have achieved that purpose. We have shown him in fulfillment of those branch prophecies. And now it comes to all of us that we might believe and have life through his name. One of the amazing things that was written was an interesting prophecy in an experience. Simon Peter went out fishing and he fished all night and he caught no fish. <laughs> and by the way, fishing is an amazing thing in those days. Do you know what the lure was? The lure was light. Up above on the fishing vessel, they would hang out over the prow a lantern and fish come to the light. When we were in Palau, we had an amazing experience with that. I haven't had a whole lot of experience with fish, but in Palau, we went swimming in Jellyfish Lake, which is an amazing place. Sounds dangerous, but it isn't because it's the only place in the world where you can swim with jellyfish because they don't sting. And um, they have come into this freshwater lake Probably there was some flood or something that brought them from the sea and they got stranded in this lake. And just as fish stranded in a cave over generations lose the ability to see and become blind fish, they no longer need it. We don't say fish turn into birds, but there is microevolution, which is small changes in, a, in an animal that can be passed on genetically. So microevolution is true. Macroevolution is not Rocks don't turn into plops in the mud, which turn into monkeys, which turn into people. No. <laughs> okay. But fish can indeed become blind and jellyfish can indeed get stranded in a lake and then lose the ability to sting as they once had generations back. And so that's what's happened in this lake. Well, anyway, when we went to swim with the jellyfish, which was an amazing experience, um, they warned us to be very careful. The jellyfish have very fragile bodies and these jellyfish don't have anything to protect themselves with. And so when you go, you, you, you can touch them, you can hold them in your hands and they're all around you and it's and, and bumping into you and it's just amazing. And you kind of try to hold really still because you don't want to hurt them. And yet you've got to stay afloat. <laughs> so you have to wiggle a little. <laughs> but anyway, um, so... I noticed though, and we noticed and we're told very quickly, if you want to find the schools of jellyfish, go where the sun is shining on the lake. And if there was shade, there would be no jellyfish there. But if you were looking in an area where the sun was shining right down on the lake, sure enough, they were drawn to the water. And that was how the fishermen fished. They would hold light over the water. And Yeshua said to his, his disciples, I am calling you to make you fishers of men. What is our allure? Light. That's right. It was an excellent analogy that Yeshua used with his fishermen who would have known this very well. So Simon goes out, he fishes all night. And that night he catches nothing. Now, are you going to catch anything the next day? No, because there's light everywhere. The fish aren't going to come near your boat. And so when Yeshua comes and he tells him, cast your net on the other side, Peter does it because after all, this is Yeshua. But as a fisherman, everything in him is saying, this isn't going to do you any good because the fish come to the light at night, but now the light is everywhere. They're not going to come. But Yeshua said, do it. 
And so when he pulled in, started to pull in the nets after he had obeyed, what did he find? Those nets were loaded, loaded. They didn't tear though. John 21, 11 says they didn't tear because the net represents bringing souls into the kingdom and not one was lost and they brought in 153. Now this is interesting. Do you know that this is the only place in scripture where somebody went fishing and the record of the fish is counted? Could there be a prophetic meeting hidden in this event? There's no idle word in scripture. Every bit is important. And so we have to allow scripture to interpret scripture. And Yeshua told his disciples that he would make them fishers of men. That's Matthew 4, 19. And in scripture, the net and the sea can represent the bringing out of people in the nations of the world. The sea is the nations of the world. We see that in the parable found in Matthew 13, verse 47 to 49. The kingdom of heaven in the parable is described as being like a net that's let down into the water and catching all kinds of fish. And when it's full, the fishermen pull it up to the shore and they sat down and they collected the good fish in the baskets and the bad they threw away. And this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. Matthew 13, 47 to 49. Now, the Hebrew letters also have numeric meaning in the same way Roman numerals are letters and numbers. The numbers attached to the letters in a Hebrew word can be added together to give a numerical total. The number 153 is the numerical total for the Hebrew words Ani Elohim, which are translated, I am God. When Yeshua caused the disciples to catch exactly 153 fish, he was declaring to them that not only was he the son of God, but that he was God himself. In addition, the expression 153 applies to the sons of God. The term sons of God occurs seven times, and by gematria, it's 153 and also the expression joint heirs. Romans 8, 17 is 1071, which is a factor of seven times 153. When the Bible says the creation of God by geometria, that adds up to 1224, 1224, which is a factor of eight times 153. Within the miracle of the 153 fishes, the word for fishes by gematria is 1,224, which is a factor of eight times 153. And again, net is a gematria of 1,224 by adding up the numeric value of the letters that spell up that word. And again, that's eight times 153, and eight is the number of new life. So there's obviously a thread that's woven through all the above meanings that is the best, it's best summed up in the expression to be the sons of God. And that speaks of those who will be counted worthy to reign with Christ in his coming kingdom. Some people believe that 153 fish refers to the salvation of the lost since the net was cast. And it does have to do with that. But those who are saved are not lost anymore. Now they are become the sons and daughters of God. And so this casting of the net is very, very significant. 153, Yah says, I am God. And 153, you will be fishers of the sons of God. Go out and catch them. And so the great gospel commission is what we see as the focus of this period of time. When he tells the disciples Go forth and make disciples of all men. Let's look at Matthew 28, 19, which is known as the Great Gospel Commission. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, just as we've lost the true Messiah, here we have brought in a Trinitarian teaching, which is very pagan. And it appears that the Bible 
teaches that there's a trinity. And yet that same gospel commission is reiterated in Acts 2.38, and there it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Yeshua Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So why is it different in, Ma in Matthew 28, 19 and in Acts 2, 38? Well, actually, there is evidence, historically speaking, to show that Matthew 28, 19 didn't always include the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In fact, it didn't used to read like that at all. Eusebius 18 times quotes Matthew 28, 19, and... Um, in every single time that he quotes it, and I only quote him as a historian, he would have had older copies of the Greek than we do. But he did say that it said, Go ye and make disciples of all nations in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And there is no mention of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, it's interesting that there is also evidence to show that Eusebius is right. The Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 263, says the baptismal formula in Matthew 28, 19 was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by the Catholic Church in the second century. Again, Eusebius was a church historian and bishop of Caesarea. I'm not saying he had everything right. He did quote Matthew 18 times, Matthew 28, 19. And um, he would have had an earlier book of Matthew in his library in Caesarea. And according to him, as an eyewitness of that earlier book, of an unaltered book of Matthew, that could have been the original for all we know, but it was certainly an earlier version than we have, Eusebius informs us of Yeshua's actual words to his disciples in the original text of Matthew 28, 19. And here is a quote from Eusebius. He said, it said, he said that it said, with one word and voice, he said to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That name is Yeshua. Former Pope Benedict, who was once Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, made this confession about the origin of the chief Trinity text of Matthew 28, 19, quote, the basic form of our Matthew 28, 19 Trinitarian profession of faith took shape during the course of the second and third centuries in connection with the ceremony of baptism. So far as its place of origin is concerned, the text came from the city of Rome. And in today's handbook for today's Catholic, page 12, it says the mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all other teachings of the church. So if we restore the unadulterated gospel commission, Yeshua was saying to his disciples before the Catholics got a hold of this verse, go ye and make disciples of all nations in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. Don't get me wrong. God has many people in the Catholic church, but the way the leadership dared to mess with the scriptures was not okay. And then Yeshua had a final sermon and some parting instructions. How important was it to hear that? How special. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do you think this message includes us today? Is he saying this to us today? Was this how to be prepared for his return? The disciples can't keep up that work. They are gone, and many generations have come and gone in between. Today, the Gospel Commission rests on your shoulders and mine. I do believe he says it to us today. Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. 
So then, after the master had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, Yeshua working with them and confirming the words with signs following. Amen. Acts 1.8 tells us the day of his ascension. It tells us, Acts 1.3, excuse me, that he was seen of them for 40 days after first fruits. 40 days of counting the Omer. And on the 40th day of counting the Omer, which is why we can put it down on a calendar, because we know when first fruits was, we can count to when 40 days later is. Indeed, it would have been June 10 on a modern calendar that the disciples were gathered there on that hillside and Yeshua told them about going and making disciples and casting out demons in his name and healing the sick and teaching the truth in all the world. And then he ascended unto heaven. Forty days. And on the 50th day, something would happen that would end the 70 weeks. Because even though Yeshua was not yet on, was still, uh, was gone, he was not on earth anymore. Physically, he was still completing the 70-week prophecy. There are 10 days more to finish. So let's look at this prophecy about Pentecost and let's see how we know that it's 50 days and how we can know what day it was. Leviticus 23.11 says, And he shall wave the sheaf for the first fruits before Yahweh to be accepted for you when? On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So during, this is during unleavened bread. That's the context in Leviticus 23. The feast of first fruits takes place during the feast of unleavened bread, but it takes place on a particular day every year. And what day is that every year? The morrow after the Sabbath, the day after the seventh day Sabbath, that number being 7676, Strong's number. And that's the same Strong's number that appears in Exodus 20, verse 8, where it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Strong's number 7676. So on the morrow after the seventh day Sabbath, the priest will do the waving of the first fruits. That tells you when first fruits is. So the weekly Sabbath that takes place within the week of unleavened bread is first fruits. Now, when is Pentecost? You have to know when first fruits is to know when Pentecost is because Pentecost is calculated from first fruits. And so in, Levitic, in Leviticus 23 verses 15 to 16, it says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. So it's telling you count from that first fruits day, which was the day after the Sabbath in unleavened bread. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Seven Sabbaths is how many days later? Seven Sabbaths would be 49 days, seven weeks. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number how many days? 50 days. And you shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. And so we call it Pentecost because that's the Greek word for it. We're often familiar with that term. In Hebrew, it was Shavuot. It was also called the Feast of Weeks because you counted seven weeks and, and the day after the seventh Sabbath. So Pentecost is also always on what day of the week? Sunday. It's always on the first day of the week. You know that because it is the morrow after or the day after the seventh Sabbath. There's no wiggle room on that, guys. It is always the day after the seventh Sabbath, which is always the first day of the week, Sunday. And when you get counting from first fruits being the day after the Sabbath in unleavened bread, when you've counted seven Sabbaths, the day after the seventh Sabbath will indeed be 50 days later. Using that method, we can confirm indeed that, that June 20 was Pentecost that year. Counting from when was the crucifixion, when was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when was first fruits within that week, and once you pin down first fruits, 50 days. Acts 1 and 2 pick up where the gospel writers have left off and get into the, the elements of the Pentecost experience. 
It says in Acts 2 verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, some theologians argue that the phrase was fully come means that they had a long-standing argument about when Pentecost took place. Is the Bible unclear about when is Pentecost? No. No, it's really clear. And that was not what was going on. This is actually a weak argument. It doesn't account for the context and the meaning of the words. So simply looking up the expression in Greek or Aramaic gives an, gives an entirely different picture. So you look up the expression was fully come, those three words, and they come from one word, which is Strong's number 4845, and it's sumplero, and it means to emplenish or to fill up, completely to swamp like a boat, of time to accomplish, passively to be complete, fully come and fill up. So that's an entirely different picture than that there's an argument over time. It's talking about swamping something, filling something like with water completely. Other scriptures that use some pleru are like Luke 8, 23, but as they sailed, he fell asleep and there came down a storm of wind in, on the lake and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. Because the, is the boat really filling with water? Yes. yes, sinking because it's really filling with water. And so here we find that the word translated as fully come in Acts 2, 1 means to be completely filled up like a boat with water. And that's significant because the disciples who experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit were indeed completely filled up with the refreshing water of the Spirit, which is called the rain. The former rain, the latter rain, these are in reference. Now in Luke 9, 51, we see it again. It says, and it came to pass when the time was come, there is that word again, that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So in addition to meaning filled up like with water, the word translated as fully come in Acts 2.1 also means that a prophetic shadow picture long foretold is now being fulfilled. Had there been a prophetic shadow picture long foretold? Yes. Daniel 70 weeks. Yeshua himself who said that he had come to send what on the earth? Fire. Fire. Yes. This was the long fulfillment, the, the culminating work that Yeshua would do as the Lamb of God, which had come to take away the sin of the world, and not just take away, but to fill up with his spirit. So, while Pentecost in Acts 2.1 was certainly a powerful fulfillment of this foretold experience, it wasn't the only outpouring. The latter rain will again fulfill this prophecy. And if you read Acts 2.1 in the Aramaic translation, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fulfilled, they were assembled together. Now remember, prophecies have three layers of fulfillment. So we, we tend to think in our uh, Greek-based Western mindset, well, if it was fulfilled, we're done with that. But we know very well there's coming around another Pentecost again, isn't there? A big one. So, Let's look at the story in Acts 1. As Yeshua is talking to them and telling them to prepare for Pentecost and pouring out the Spirit upon them. Acts 1, 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. That was on that 10th day. Uh, excuse me, that 40th day. And now on the 50th day, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and when the day of Pentecost was fulfilled, and they were filled up like a boat with water, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. By the way, if you want to know the future for Yah's people, read the book of Acts. 
because these things that you see in that book, they're coming around again. Now, let's go back to Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression. This is a sealing work, isn't it? To make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's coming around again. And the way the disciples were to prepare for it the first time is the way we are to prepare for it in the future. Hosea 10 verse, 11, 10 verse 12 says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek Yahweh till he come and do what? Rain righteousness upon you. Rain, the Holy Spirit being poured out, is like water, like rain. And yet it manifests like fire. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Yahweh is eager to give us his spirit. I'm thankful for that. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall knock. And it shall uh, seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask him? There are many names for the Feast of Pentecost, as I've mentioned. In Exodus 34, 22, it's referred to as the Feast of Weeks. In Exodus 23, 16, it's called the Feast of Harvest. The reason for the Feast of Weeks is because there are seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, and it's the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. The reason it's called the Feast of the Harvest is because it ends the barley harvest and begins the wheat harvest. It's also called in Hebrew Shavuot. The Greek name Pentecost means 50th because it's the 50th day, Acts 2 verse 1. It is also known as the day of the assembly, and it's called that when the children of Israel were standing at the base of Mount Sinai in the third biblical month on the day of the assembly, Deuteronomy 18, 16, that Yahweh came down and gave his law from the top of Mount Sinai. And because it was the conclusion of the barley harvest, it was known as atzeret, which means conclusion. Bearing that in mind, let's look at some of these prophecies of the Feast of Pentecost. Deuteronomy 16, 9 to 12 says, Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee, and thou shalt keep what? The Feast of Weeks. That's one of the names of this time of um, numbering the seven weeks and with a tr uh, tribute of free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto Yahweh thy God, according as Yahweh thy God hath blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice before Yahweh thy Elohim, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant, thy maidservant, the Levite that is within thy gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow there are among you in the place which Yahweh thy Elohim hath chosen to place his name there. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondsman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. Now, as I mentioned, Pentecost is the time of concluding the barley harvest. And so when you begin at Passover, the barley harvest is just beginning. And we have the first fruits of the barley on the Passover table. The first fruits was marked at the earthquake in Yeshua's death. It was harvested at the resurrection which is when the high priest would go out and cut it, which happened at the end of the seventh day Sabbath. And it was waved on the day of first fruits. And this was barley, not wheat, barley. Barley represents the 144,000, the grain that ripens first, the harvest that comes in first. Pentecost is the end of that first harvest. And when 
the Feast of Pentecost comes, you no longer offer unleavened barley bread. Now the barley loaves are leavened. And the reason is because leaven represents two things. It represents an agent, basically, that is so powerful that a small amount affects the whole lump of dough. And in the Bible, we are told that we are the lump of dough in the analogy, and a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And so we are to purge out the leaven of hypocrisy and malice and wickedness. But also, Yeshua said, the leaven of the kingdom was to be in our lives. The leaven of the kingdom is a different leaven. So there's the leaven of sin, which a little bit affects the whole lump. And there's also the leaven of the kingdom. And so you become unleavened with the world. And then the time of counting the Omer, which is the period of time from first fruits to Pentecost, is where you're becoming re-leavened now with the leaven of the kingdom. You aren't to be left empty. A dough with nothing. No. Leavened with the leaven of the kingdom. And so at the time of Pentecost, the presentation of the barley was that it was baked into leaven loaves. Here it is in 2 Kings 4.42. And there came a man from Baal Shalisha, which brought the man of God bread of the first fruits. What kind of grain? The barley, first fruits. 20 loaves of barley. And this is leavened barley loaves. And this is an appropriate presentation for this time of year because we have finished the week of unleavened bread and we are now at the Pentecost harvest. Exodus 34, 22 says, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Okay, so we finished the barley harvest. The first fruits of that was at Passover. And now the fruit of it was to bring the loaves of barley at the timing of Pentecost. But here at the Feast of Weeks, we see that we are having the first fruits of a different harvest. What? Wheat. So Pentecost is an important day because it is a dividing line between two harvests. The barley is finished and the wheat begins. Now that's very significant because the Bible tells you that the 70 weeks prophecy is a judgment prophecy. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people in thy holy city, right? When the 70 weeks is up, when the Pentecost has come and the, and the, and the uh, first fruits has been brought in of barley, can any more barley come in? No. The barley's done. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Barley's done. Now is the time of the wheat. And wheat is an entirely different grain. Are they saved? Yes. In fact, wheat will be gathered in at the end of the world. The Bible says that he'll gather the tares into bundles to be burned and the wheat will be gathered into bundles and put into his barn. Are they saved? Yes. But the barley is the first fruits which is a symbol of the 144,000, which is rel relatively a small amount of grain compared to the overall size of the harvest. And so Pentecost is the pivot point between the two crops. It begins be the wheat and it marks the end of the barley. And the end of something is a judgment being up, period. It is now too late to be among the barley when this Pentecost took place. And the barley and the wheat are two separate groups of people. The 144,000 are the final barley. The disciples were among the barley of the first period. Along with those people that were taken to heaven. Revelation 14, 1 to 5. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 140 and 4,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 that were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are, were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now there's two meanings of first fruits. There is barley being first fruits because it's the early harvest in totality. And there's also the first fruits of the barley, which is what was on the Passover table. So the earliest part of the barley coming in 
What was the earliest part of the barley coming in in this manifestation in Yeshua's experience? It was the saints who were resurrected and taken to heaven. They were the earliest part of the first fruits, and they were ripe at Passover. They were taken to heaven right there at that first fruits that was affiliated with unleavened bread. And 50 days after, we now have the conclusion. And in that upper room, there are 120 people gathered and they are the first fruits, the end of the barley harvest when Yeshua was here. Nobody else can be barley. It's done in that manifestation. Now, the barley is the group, the spirit and the bride say, come, who wakes the sleeping virgins? The bride. Yeah. In, in symbolic picture, it's the bride. Now I'm talking, I'm mixing end time uh, prophecy in here with the disciples. I'm trying to show you the shadow picture. The disciples went forth, those people in that upper room, that 120 people, and they took the gospel to the whole world. And was there a huge harvest? Yes. yes. And in that manifestation, that was the wheat. And what ended the barley? Pentecost. And what began the harvesting of the wheat? Pentecost. Yeah. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Seventy weeks. And in the end, there will be seventy weeks. Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Where do you go first? Jerusalem, those are the sleeping virgins, and all Judea. That's the people who should be the, the body of Christ, but they are sleeping virgins. And remember, the virgins are not the bride in the analogy. And then you go to Samaria. Samaria are those who have a, um, a basis of, of Christianity, so to speak, but uh, they've twisted it all up. They had their own Torah, their own place to worship. Everything else was all really, it was really twisted up. Even more than the Jews had messed things up, I suppose you could say doctrinally. And then after that, you go to the people who don't make any claim on God at all. The uttermost parts of the earth. The wheat harvest continues until the end of the world. Matthew 13, 24 to 30, another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root out also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until when? The harvest. the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say unto the reapers, Gather ye therefore first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, in the final manifestation of this, we're talking the end of the world. But there was a shadow picture manifestation in the life of Christ and the early Christian church. And there was a period of judgment. The barley judgment ended at Pentecost. The wheat harvest began then. And the wheat harvest ended and, and all of that was done um, with the abomination of desolation, which was set up. So in each case, we have this, um, we have this shadow picture that is giving us a view of the end. It's going to be the glasses that we can put on to understand how the 70 weeks prophecy will be played out in the final round. You see, Pentecost is a feast that comes with a promise. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the former rain comes with a promise that there will be a latter rain. And the latter rain will be what? Greater than the former. More harvest, more. Joel 2, 23 to 24 says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your God, for he hath given you the former rain. How? Moderately. Moderately but he will cause, the, cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. 
So what's the result of this former rain? The floor of the harvest is full of what? Wheat. wheat. And wheat is the second group, the group that are brought to salvation through the work of the barley. And then what will be the result? The vats will overflow with wine, wine representing true doctrine, and oil representing the Holy Spirit. But here's an interesting part that we need to pay attention to that really throws things off track. Again, those translators got in there. It says the latter rain will come in the first month. Okay, that doesn't compute. What month is Pentecost in? The third month. It's in the third month. Always. 50 days after first fruits will always put you in the third month. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy that the children of Israel on the day of the assembly were at the base of Mount Sinai in the third biblical month. Pentecost is always the third month. So what are we talking about? We're all confused now. But actually, if you notice the word month is in brackets, it's an added word. What it really should say, you look up first, it means like it was before. The latter rain will come the same way it did before, only greater. That's what it means. Not the first month. What message ripens the wheat? What message did the apostles give? They went out giving that gospel commission, just as Yeshua had told them to do. Matthew 3, 11 to 12, Yeshua is giving them instructions. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, this is John, sorry, cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather what? The wheat, the wheat into the garner, and he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Absolutely. You see, that work that began at the baptism wasn't finished until the fire was sent and he would be bringing his wheat into the garner. Yah is eager to give us the Holy Spirit. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And what was the result? of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Wow. Thousand in the day, first day. What was the result? The glad tidings of the risen Savior were carried to the uttermost parts of the inhabited world in very short order. Hearts yielded to the power of the message. Thousands were converted in a day. Yes, it was like spiritual lightning. And when lightning strikes... A bolt current is up to 30,000 amperes. Lightning strikes with 1 million plus volts. And in less than a second, the lightning heats the air up to 15,000 to 60,000 degrees. And it's the rapid air expansion from that tremendous heat that causes thunder. In fact, lightning doesn't start from the sky. It starts from the ground. The Ions in the air are attracted to the upward leader of ions that is generated from the ground. And so the apostles had the job. Go ye therefore. And Yeshua had been working in his disciples to prepare them to receive the Holy Spirit. And in the same way, the work will be done on the ground to prepare for the final outpouring. We need to be ready for that, don't we? Jeremiah 3, 1 to 3 says, But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith Yahweh. Thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. Thou hadst a whore's forehead, and thou refusest to be ashamed. Forehead meaning you think, think in an um, unfaithful to God way. And in Jeremiah it says, But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear Yahweh our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. 
Deuteronomy 11, 16 to 18, take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then Yahweh's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit. And lest you perish quickly from off the good land, which Yahweh giveth you. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And preparing for the rain, this was the work the disciples were doing in the upper room. This was the, dis the work that Yeshua was doing with his disciples while he was here. Leviticus 26, 3 to 4, if you walk in my statutes and keep them and do them, then I will give you the rain in due season and the land shall yield her increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Our part in receiving the rain, and it shall come to pass if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day to love Yahweh with your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. The former rain is the prerequisite to the latter. And so when Yeshua was here, we see him building the street and repairing the old path, just as it said in uh, Daniel chapter 9. He says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Doctrine, speech. Look them up with your Strong's Concordance. Doctrine is instruction and speech is commandment. And so we do see that he was exonerating his Torah in all of his work and in his preparation of his disciples to receive the latter rain, the first rain. And that is the same way we will be prepared in the future. Isaiah 8, 16, bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. Yes, dear ones, the 70 weeks prophecy was a powerful promise, but it was also a warning. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Why has no one gotten the memo that when the 70 weeks ended with that amazing Pentecost in 28 AD, that Jerusalem was no longer the holy city. And it was because they did not, we have not gotten that memo that we have bought into a, a teaching that is preparing us for the final abomination of desolation. Regarding Jerusalem's role as the holy city, a title which it received because it had the holy temple of God, Yeshua gave a powerful warning. And this prophecy is based on Daniel chapter 9, which is, as I've mentioned, perhaps the most ignored of all Bible prophecies. And yet it was never more vitally important than it is now. Yeshua himself said that Jerusalem's house, which is a reference to its temple, was left unto it desolate. Matthew 23, 37 to 38. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. What is the house that Yeshua is referring to? The word house in this passage is translated from the Greek word, uh, which is Strong's number 3624. It means a dwelling, literally or figuratively, a home, a household, a temple. And according to the lexical aids, this word can apply both to a literal temple and a figurative one because we are the temple of the living God. But it refers to, and it actually says in the lex lexical aids, to God dwelling in the temple at Jerusalem. It also refers to dwelling as Christ dwells in his people and the Holy Ghost his spirit in the faithful. Disregarding the prophecies of Daniel is serious. Not paying attention to this prophecy will cause us to miss who is the true Messiah and to be looking to the wrong place for the presence of God on earth. Matthew 23, 37 to 38 says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, 
as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That word desolate is the same word in the um, Greek from which we get this English version that appears later in Matthew 24, one chapter away in verse 23 to 26. Exact same word. Only in Matthew 24, verse 26, it's translated as desert. So I'd like to read that to you, but I want to remind you it's the very same word. Jerusalem is left desolate, as in abomination of desolation, turf. And in Matthew 24, it says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. That word for desert is desolate place. It's the same place that Yeshua said Jerusalem was. Now think about that for just a moment. After this pronouncement had been made, when the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy had been fulfilled, when the abomination of desolation came later and was set up in that temple, do you know where the people went for help? They went to the temple. They were expecting help from the temple. But they had ignored all of the warnings. They had ignored the prophecy. They had ignored the words of Yeshua and turned their backs on him. And so what they found at the temple was that judgment began at the house of God. And the blood ran up to the horse's bridles. This is a shadow picture for what it will be like for us in the end. As mankind again rejects the Daniel 9 prophecy, as we again turn our eyes, eyes away from these fulfillments, as we do these things, we do them to our own destruction. It is very serious stuff. And I do believe perhaps there may be no more important prophecy in all scripture than the prophecy of Daniel 9, past and future. We need to have the right Messiah. We need to be watching the prophecy. We need to understand the sealing message. And we certainly don't want to miss it when our Savior sends the fire again. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your help in this study so far. And I just pray that you'll bless us as we continue our personal studies on this matter at home. For this is certainly a very important subject that we need to understand thoroughly. And I pray that you'll help us to that end, as there are so many twists and misconstruals and misunderstandings and misapplications that take away from your word. And I just pray that we'll be rooted and grounded in your word and not taken out by these false winds. I also pray, Father, that you'll bless us in understanding how it was fulfilled in Yeshua's life and ministry, and also then to have the eyes to see its future fulfillment, which we will be looking into next time. And we praise you and thank you and ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen.